Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm Martha Morgan. I'm the Water Programs Director at the Nashua River Watershed Association. And for those of you not familiar with the NRWA, we are a member supported organization based in Groton. And our three main focus areas for the NRWA are um, land protection, education, and water resource protection uh, in the 32 communities in Massachusetts and New Hampshire that make up our watershed. If you're not currently a member, I invite you to become one. Uh, for questions, um, I didn't ask the speakers this, but um, you can you can let me know. But we we can have a question and answer series at the um, at the end of both of the talks. There's going to be two talks, and um, maybe after each of them, we can have talks. And if somebody really has a a, a burning question, you can interrupt. Um, but maybe maybe raise your hand or put a question in the chat. Um, this is a six in a series of talks. Um, about rivers and fisheries, river restoration, trout refugia, um, climate change and, and trout refugia, um, the return of river herring, and the importance of good water quality and mussel habitat, which is what we're talking about tonight, today, today this morning. <laughs> um, and if you've received an email announcing this talk, you'll um, receive emails about these two upcoming talks. So we're going to talk again about mussels on May 6th with um, Peter Hazelton of the University of Georgia, formerly of NISAP in Massachusetts, and also uh, Jason Carbignani of um, the aquatic, well, he's an aquatic ecologist at NISAP. And then on the 13th of May, we'll have Rebecca Canones, who's talking about climate water, cold water climate refugia. And before starting, I, I have to, acknowledge the Massachusetts Environmental Trust who is funding these presentations. And they get their funding through the whale plate and the Leaping Brook Trout. And you can find those plates at whaleplate.org. They're also funding uh, work that we did to install temperature loggers in streams uh, throughout the watershed. So I'm delighted to introduce our morning speakers, Catherine Abbott, and Isla Skarupa. Um, Kate is currently, they're both PhD students at the University of Massachusetts in the Department of Environmental Conservation and with the USGS Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit at UMass Amherst. Kate's currently working with Dr. Allison Roy to understand how stream water quality, macroinvertebrates, and fish respond to small dam removals across Massachusetts. And Isla's work is focused on developing a restoration strategy for a rare freshwater mussel, the brook floater in Massachusetts watersheds. So now I'm going to turn it over to Isla and Kate. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us, Martha. Um, so instead of two separate talks, we thought we would um, try to combine our research. And so it's going to be one long talk. So if you guys want to save questions for the end, that would be great. So I'll share my screen. That sounds great, thank you. Does that look okay? All right, so today we're going to talk about um, how we can enhance stream integrity. And we're combining some of the things we've learned from our research on both dam removal and muscle conservation to tackle this topic. Um, and so just so you're familiar, I'm Kate. And I study the dam removals in Massachusetts. Um, and, and I'm Isla, so I've really focused on mussels and we've uh, attempted to combine our research here to kind of give off a holistic view. So stream integrity is in our title of this talk, but stream integrity is really difficult to define because it depends on who you talk to or what spatial um, scale you're referencing. And so this paper in 2015 defines the integrity of a watershed as the capacity of a watershed to support and maintain the full range of ecological processes and functions essential to the sustainability of biodiversity and of the watershed resources and services provided to society.
And relevant to stream integrity is the concept of what consists of a healthy system or a healthy stream. And different managers and scientists have different perspectives on what healthy means. Um, some biologists might think that if a system supports endangered species or abundant fish populations, that's healthy. Um, where engineers or geomorphologists might consider a really stable stream with natural sediment transport to be healthy. And there might be specific abiotic characteristics such as the presence of cold water refugia or the connectivity to a lake and pond, particularly for migratory fish species. And so these different perspectives can make it challenging to decide on a strategy to increase um, stream integrity. So some strategies employed by scientists or managers are to add large wood to streams. So this helps to stabilize the sediment. Um, the bed stability can also provide important habitat features or cover for the fish. And then also it's a large carbon addition to the stream and can provide substrate for macroinvertebrates to attach to. Um, another um, option that we will be discussing today is that of muscle conservation. So mussels are really important to streams. They're, they are considered ecosystem engineers and they have the ability to really change the habitat around them and um, change the food web. And some managers or practitioners might employ dam removals or culvert replacements like they're doing at Sucker Brook. And they'll often use these methods to increase um, or enhance natural water or sediment flows and change the system from more of a pond or lake um, habitat to a natural stream. Um, you can also employ riparian zone restoration, which would include like tree plantings or um, land conservation to provide shading to the stream and reduce temperatures and also to stabilize the banks and prevent some erosion from happening. Um, and so there's a lot of different strategies you can use. And so one of the things that managers need to think of is which approach is best. And um, so there are different trade-offs and um, different metrics that will be improved using each of these methods. And so you need to think about what your overall goal for restoration is. Um, and today we're going to focus on what we study at UMass, which is muscle conservation and dam removals. And so there are many reasons to remove a dam and one of the most common ones is for a socioeconomic purpose. Often these dams are very old um, mill dams and they don't serve their original purpose. Um, and they can even be a hazard to the community because people might um, encounter them canoeing or if they fail during a flood, they can damage infrastructure um, downstream. And so dam removal is used to remove that hazard from the system. For ecological reasons, dam removal can serve many purposes. It can restore natural channel form, um, encourage the flow of sediment and water, and increase dissolved oxygen, which is often um, lower in impoundments. Chemically, dam removal can reduce the overall temperature of the stream because you're reducing um, the amount of area exposed to solar radiation. And it can restore more natural nutrient dynamics instead of like a eutrophic pond that accumulates algae and nutrients, you have that um, flowing water system again. And one of the main reasons for dam removal is, is biological. So it can help to restore fish and macroinvertebrate populations to a more natural state. And especially for migratory fish, it can allow passage up to their spawning grounds. Um, and we know a little bit less about how dam removal affects muscle distributions. And so I'll have Isla talk about that. So we know that dams provide all these benefits and these benefits can be really helpful for freshwater mussels. Um, they're dependent on a lodic environment. So when you go in and remove the dam, you're restoring the natural flow regime, which enables their filter feeding and their extraction of oxygen from the water. And when you restore this natural flow, temperature, and oxygen regime, it also supports um, the native host fishes and macroinvertebrate assemblages that Kate mentioned. 
And so these are really important for freshwater mussels because they're dependent on um, certain species of host fish to complete their development. Um, pictured here is a freshwater mussel and it has a um, lure. So this is meant to mimic a small fish or minnow. And it will basically twitch this, this lure to attract a larger fish. And once a larger fish attacks it, it will, the mussel will release its larvae and this larvae will attach all over the, the host fish. And it will stay on that host for a couple of weeks to a month. Um, it, will, it will develop and then they will drop off as small mussels. So by removing that dam, you're really lengthening the stream connectivity and you're allowing for dispersal of mussels into um, new or suitable habitat. And, um, and this can really enhance the, the connectivity within the stream. And so I'd just like to also point out this paper from Sethia all in 2004 that, that mentions that the pre-removal assessments and mitigation, especially related to freshwater mussels is really important because they can't um, simply move or, or run away, so to speak. And so there can be really strong negative short-term effects when it comes uh, to, to mussels and, and sediments kind of blanketing mussel beds. So why do we care about preserving freshwater mussels? They, um, this slide mentions a lot of things and I'll just go over a few of them, but how they're situated in the sediment. So their, their foot is um, burrowed into the sediment and this can cre create oxygenation. But then they also link the above water column to the sediment. So they filter feed, they filter the water through and then they process phytoplankton or bacteria, zooplankton, and then they excrete this and they biodeposit those nutrients back into the sediment. So this nutrient cycling can actually support um, different kinds of bacteria that have the capacity to completely remove nitrogen from the system. And they also have the physical ability of modifying their habitat because really dense mussel beds will affect the overall flow of the river, the flow across the bed. Um, and it will also help to stabilize the substrate. So my research, my research is really focused on five species of freshwater mussels. Um, and in Massachusetts, the triangle floater is unlisted. The creeper is a species of concern. The brook floater is endangered in the state. The eastern pearl shell and eastern olipio are unlisted and they're both um, can be really common, especially in the Nisitissit River and in Tucker Brook. And so this assemblage of mussels is found or was found around the Millie Turner Dam and is found um, around Tucker Brook. And if you're not familiar with these dams, um, the Millie Turner Dam was on the Nisitissit River. Um, this was removed in September of 2015. It was considered a high hazard dam in poor condition. Um, and there was some downstream infrastructure, namely the, the bridge there um, that was at risk yeah, part, no, in case yeah. the, the dam failed at any point. So that was one of the major reasons for its removal. It's also surrounded by conservation land as an area of um, critical environmental concern um, and core habitat as specified by Mass Wildlife. And so the dam was removed to both conserve that habitat and remove the hazard. Um, the Sucker Brook Dam on Sucker Brook is still standing and Sucker Brook is a tributary to the Nisitissit River. Um, the removal is planned for this fall. And I know we mentioned that on the, the last, the, talk in this series. Um, this dam isn't registered, so it's not really being removed because it's a hazard, but more because it has the potential to restore some aquatic habitat in this area. And so those two dams are part of a larger study that I'm a part of at UMass, looking at ecological responses to dam removals across the state. And so this map just shows um, the whole suite of removals that I'm working on and we're assessing temperature, dissolved oxygen, um, macroinvertebrates and fish at all of these sites. This is not up. And so when we look at temperature and the relationship with dams, we can compare the upstream reference condition to the downstream temp 
temperature and see how much warming is occurred um, due to those dams. And we use these hobo loggers to, to measure that. And a lot of this work was done by um, the former master student, Pete Seidel, who recently published his research in ecological indicators. And across um, Massachusetts dams that we monitored, he found that the majority of them um, increased water temperatures downstream of the dams. And you can see the, the quite um, large range of, of different responses we see to dams. And I'm just highlighting here Millie Turner and Sucker Brook, because um, those are relevant to us here in the Nashua watershed. And so Turner, we saw some downstream warming due to the dam, but at Sucker Brook, we actually see um, the highest amount of warming, over four degrees um, from any site that we've monitored. And what that looks like in the stream is this. So this is a plot of mean summer temperatures at different locations in the stream. So here in blue is upstream. Um, and then we have yellow, which is the impoundment water temperature, and then a series of loggers going downstream all the way to the confluence with the Nisitis at about 1.5 kilometers. And you can see um, much colder temperatures upstream and almost four degree difference between upstream and the impoundment. And although it's quite shaded, going downstream from the impoundment, um, we don't really see recovery of temperatures um, to meet the upstream reference condition at Sucker Brook. Um, prior to removal, Millie Turner Dam had a similar pattern with um, downstream warming, although to a much lesser extent. So we saw upstream temperatures cooler and then um, warmer impoundment and downstream temperatures prior to removal. Um, following dam removal at the end of 2015, we saw the return to a more natural thermal regime. And so what I mean by that is that the upstream temperature um, remains kind of consistent going downstream. So we're not seeing that, that high increase due to the impoundment being wide and exposed to a lot of sun. Um, and we might see different trends at different sites because um, some sites might take longer to revegetate and eventually create enough canopy cover to shade, shade the stream. Um, so even in 2020, we actually see lower temperature, water temperatures in the impoundment um, because it's still kind of a deeper pool. And dissolved oxygen in the water column is closely tied to temperature um, with colder temperatures being able to hold more um, dissolved oxygen in the water. So when we look at a comparison between the upstream dissolved oxygen concentrations and the impoundment, um, prior to removal, we see um, reduced dissolved oxygen levels within the impoundment. Um, and here I'm showing a bunch of different sites. So I've just highlighted Turner's here at the end in the right. Um, and so prior to removal, we see lower dissolved oxygen levels in the impoundment. And then within a year following removal, we see recovery of dissolved oxygen. And this has implications for fish and macroinvertebrates that can be very sensitive to changes in dissolved oxygen. So macroinvertebrates in particular are sensitive to changes in DO because they have um, very particular gill structures that can absorb oxygen, um, especially it needs to be flowing water for most of them. Um, they're sensitive to temperature changes, um, sensitive to sand and gravel, so the substrate um, in which they can either burrow or hide from predators. And they also respond to changes in hydrology and nutrients. And so all of these factors combine and exert um, effects on their metabolism and activity when they emerge and overall their species comp composition. And so we've been monitoring macroinvertebrate assemblages and species compositions at Millie Turner Dam um, prior to and following dam removal. And when I talk about macroinvertebrates, um, I'm not including mussels in this. I'll leave that to Isla. Um, but this includes things like dragonfly larvae, 
And if you're a fly fisherman, then things like caddisflies or stoneflies. Um, and because of their sensitivity to these different water quality and environmental factors, they're often used to indicate water quality. Um, and so this plot here on the left is the Hilsenhoff Biotic Index. And this is a measure of basically how tolerant the assemblage is to water quality, to pollution. Um, so actually higher values indicate more tolerant species are present and there's more pollution likely. So at uh, Millie Turner, we found fairly good water quality um, with the downstream being slightly, um, slightly worse, still considered good, but some organic pollution um, was possible. And then following removal, we see a slight increase, but we don't see a major change. And what I was really looking for was um, a decrease or an increase in biotic, this biotic index um, indicating um, that the dam removal may have caused some like sedimentation or pollution, but we didn't really see that, which is a positive sign. When we look at species richness, which is the number of total species that you find in a sample, we see actually slightly higher richness downstream of the dam prior to removal. And then immediately following removal in 2016, we saw much lower richness indicating that these um, organisms are responding to the dam removal and possibly the sediment release. But then what's notable is that in 2017, just two years following removal, we see um, downstream richness similar to upstream richness. And this suggests that macroinvertebrates are able to quickly recolonize um, because they have the ability to drift downstream or to aerially disperse. And so they recover fairly quickly. What we know less about is how longer lived or endangered species recover following dam removal, especially if they can't um, recolonize so quickly. Great. So um, to learn about the muscle component around the Millie Turner dam removal, I would encourage you to watch the talk on May 6th with Peter Hazelton because we'll be talking about that. Um, but we do know that we find mussels in high abundance uh, downstream and sometimes upstream of dams. And this isn't really new information. A lot of these observations have been um, documented in states down south and less so in New England. But in Secker Brook, we do know that there's a population of Brookloader, the um, state endangered mussel right downstream of, of um, the dam. So, Part of my work surveying for brook floater was to visit the watersheds where we know that they still exist. And so for Massachusetts, um, there's only four populations left, and that's in the Nisitissit River, including Sucker Brook, um, Bachelor Brook, the West Branch of the Farmington, and the Lair River. And here, each of these circle colors represent the different river, and um, they are um, different habitats within 100 meter reaches. And so Next to this bar here is zero is zero distance to the dam. And then the meters is the distance downstream from that dam. And so for brick floater, we do see this trend where in general, they're um, in higher abundances directly downstream of dams. So part of restoring the species is trying to understand their habitat. And one of our research questions was, do species abundance differ between mesohabitat types? So mesohabitats could be a dammed pool where there's a block in flow of the water from um, wood or human construction, a riffle where there's just turbidity at the surface, a scour pool, which is a geological depression, and then um, a run where there's free flowing water. This of course is the beautiful Nisitissit River. So to sample these meso habitats, we would visit coordinates and then delineate a 100 meter reach and then separate that reach into meso habitat types. And then observers would snorkel their way upstream. So each of these lanes represents um, where an observer would snorkel. So we would cover the entire width of the river. We would snorkel upstream or use a clear bottom view bucket and collect freshwater mussels, which we would then identify to species. 
and all of these searches were timed. So abundance is measured as catch per unit effort. So we, sur we surveyed sites um, where we knew we could find brook water. So in the Nashua, we really focused on the Nisitisit, this included Tucker Brook, and then also the Swanicook River, which has some really great habitat. Um, and all of the survey work was in summer and fall from 2016 to 2018. Um, so the black circles here are all the sites that we surveyed. They're the 100 meter reaches. And this equated to surveying about 145 mesohabitat types um, across the, the state of Massachusetts. So here I'm showing you um, a plot from results from a mixed effect model where the y axis is abundance. Um, and then the x axis is the mesohabitat type. And the n indicates the number of mesohabitat types that we surveyed. So we can see that there's really large variability in abundance for this species. And we also analyzed if species were using certain mesohabitat types relative to what was available in the river reach. And we found that there was no preference in the mesohabitat types that were used. And this was really consistent for the, the other species in the assemblage, triangle floater, creeper, eastern pearl shell. Um, eastern elliptio exhibited some differences in abundance where they were found more in runs than riffles and scour pools. And they also preferred certain mesohabitat types and this really changed based on the river. Um, one interesting thing that came out of this was this variability in abundance around dam pools and at sometimes um, species reaching high abundances. So we looked further into this to see what types of pools each of these species were using. So it's not too surprising um, that when we see a brook floater and what type of pool they're using, they tend to have high abundances in pools created by humans. Um, so again, this is catch per unit effort and abundance on the y-axis. And the N indicates the number of river reaches that contain these mesohabitat observations. And these are um, raw data from, from basically just pop calls. We do see that this pool use um, shifts a little bit for triangle floater where they're using pools created by beaver. Um, Eastern elliptio are using um, also pools for, created by humans. So this could also include um, just old construction on the landscape that's creating a shallow impoundment. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, an intact dam like you and I think of. And then Eastern pearl shell is surprisingly also using some pools created by beaver. And then Almost all species have this outlier of really high abundance in um, pools created from large wood. So this is kind of unexpected habitat. Um, it's not new information, but it's just not really documented uh, very often in New England. And this is an example from Singer and Gingloff, a paper published in 2011 that explains this. Um, and here they were looking at a mussel population directly downstream from a run of river mill dam. And this is represented as the square. And then they also had an upstream reference site in the triangle and then a downstream, five kilometers downstream site. And they found that the length of these mussels represented as the squares were much higher directly downstream from these, um, from the mill impoundment. And they also saw higher growth rates, higher abundance, and they tried to figure out why that was, but a lot of factors are correlated. And so they had several different hypotheses that this larger muscle size was correlated with reproductive output. So these larger muscles were producing more juveniles. And then the fact that they had higher growth rate, these juveniles were basically growing faster. So they had, um, basically limited mortality because there's higher mortality when they're smaller. And then the spring and autumn temperatures were higher in the dam impoundment, which led to these higher growth rates and also this production of algae and bacteria, which contributed to their food. Um, lastly, they thought that because the mill dam was slowly releasing water, it allowed for continued wetted wits during droughts. 
So this is just one example of how dams and streams with imperiled mussel populations should be examined on a case-by-case -case basis. And so not only do you need to assess the adjacent um, endangered species populations like the abundant brook floater at Sucker Brook, um, you also need to consider that dams are not the same and they're not placed in the landscape um, in a consistent way. And so we might expect different responses to dam removals um, across these different characteristics. Um, so dams are different heights, ages, they have different impoundment sizes that can affect um, stream response following removal. They're also located in different kinds of reaches with either shaded or open canopies um, with different substrates. It's either sandy or a cobble bottom and they're different sizes with different temperatures. Um, and they're also located in different places. So when you compare Sucker Brook or Millie Turner um, dams to dams within urbanized watersheds, we might see different responses because of the, the different land uses um, and impervious covers. And then there's also the added factor of adjacent dams or culverts um, that can change the responses. And so this creates a lot of um, uncertainties in looking at dams and dam removals and how um, mussels and temperature and macroinvertebrates might respond to these restoration efforts. So fortunately, as scientists, we have unbiased data and we provide this data to managers or other researchers and those managers are the ones that have to make the decisions. And so, um, Fortunately, at Mass Wildlife and the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, they're aware of all these challenges and they put so much effort and decision analysis into um, what dams to remove and taking the holistic perspective of the watershed. And so um, lastly, we'll just put in a plug for the May 6th talk. So Dr. Peter Hazleton was the aquatic ecologist during the Millie Turner Dam removal. And um, now Jason Carvignani is the aquatic ecologist who um, is basically uh, finished the monitoring work for that and has some interesting habitat data with mussels. So we get the easy fun part of, of field work and they have to do the hard work of decision making. Yeah. Um, and so I'd just like to acknowledge the many people that have contributed to both of these projects. Um, for the dam removal project, we work very closely with Aaron Rogers, um, Mass Division of Ecological Restoration, Mass Wildlife. Um, and a number of, of UMass interns and technicians have helped with, with field work. Um, for the Muscle Project, uh, Peter Hazelton, now at University of Georgia, Dave Perkins and Timothy Warren at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Andy Fisk at the Connecticut River Conservancy, um, Sean Serrett at Monmouth University, and Jason Carmignani at Mass Wildlife. Um, and also, we also have a lot of separate funders, but I think um, both of our projects were funded by the Massachusetts Environmental Trust and their solid license plates. So we'd be happy to take any questions or chat with you guys more about our research. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. I didn't expect the uh, the unexpected there about the muscles. <laughs> so um, we do have some questions. Oh, Peter Hazelton is there. <laughs> Great talk, y'all, he says. Um, hello, Peter. So a couple of questions. Um, could you please discuss briefly the trade-off of dam removals versus using water power for electricity? Sure, I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so the, the dam removals that I research and that are mostly being conducted in Massachusetts are really looking at small mill dams that are run of river. Um, and so these were originally built in the late 1800s or even prior to that, when they're like late 1700s, um, to power like grist mills, sawmills, things like that. And so they're not really able to be producing electric power. They were producing like power back then, but they're not serving that purpose anymore. Um, and it's very expensive to retrofit with, with like small turbines. Um, so I know people often think that you might be able to like add. Um, turbines or hydropower to these small dams, but it's not really feasible. 
Um, so we're not talking about removing like the Holyoke Dam or Turner's Falls. Um, those are, are very profitable and useful for our communities, but these small dams that are creating hazards and not really producing power um, are the ones being considered for removal. Thank hope you. that answers your question. Mm -hmm. um, you could probably stop sharing so we can see each sure. other maybe. Um, so it's another question, are crayfish also an indicator of watershed health and is that being um, monitored or studied also? Um, neither one of us study crayfish, but I think uh, I think it would be really interesting to. And um, since Pete's here, I'm gonna pick on you if you have anything to add to that. <laughs> Pete's at the University of Georgia now. Um, yeah, it's it's a great question. And uh, I don't think that crayfish are typically used as an indicator species of system health. There might be some, some crayfish that are more or less tolerant to different environmental conditions like the other macroinvertebrates Kate talked about. But in Massachusetts, um, really, we only have about 11 species of crayfish and eight of them are non-native. Um, and so the crayfish that you are finding and also uh, the different species is generally a sign of habitat type rather than uh, ecosystem condition. So there are some species that are like lower gradient streams, some species like larger streams, and there's a few species that like small cold water streams, but uh, the species that you're finding is typically dependent on the other crayfish and fish that are there. Great, thank All you. Right. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, so another question, do you compare your results of streams with dams versus stream environments without dams? If so, is there anything you can share? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, it's something I've thought about because we need to compare our research and our data from the dam streams to a reference condition um, to be able to determine like how the dam is influencing the stream. And so for my reference, I'm using upstream sections of the same river that is outside of the influence of the dam. So in that way, we're trying to capture um, the same landscape context as the dammed section of the stream um, with the same kind of organisms that you'd expect to find in it. Um, although it's, a, it's not a different stream. So we are comparing undammed reaches to the dam streams to be able to, to see differences in that. Um, and so some of the, the data that I shared was looking at the upstream versus downstream. Um, and so the upstream data I'd consider to be an undammed section of the stream, if that makes sense. Thank you. Hmm. Um, any other questions? People can just unmute themselves and, and speak up. You have other questions? Sure. Um, I, I raise my hand. Hi, I'm a really terrific talk to each of you. Great pressure. Well, the, we can't hear you too I, well, Bruce. Can you speak into the your microphone yeah, a little better? You know, it may be, let me turn this off. Hold on one second. <laughs> <laughs> The world according to Zoom. All right. Is that better? Yes, I think Is that so. Better? Yes, much better. Yeah, I had my earbuds in, so it wasn't working. I'm sorry. That's so okay. I, I want to say a really terrific talk. I'm, I've, I've been um, a chair of the Bear Hill Pond Watershed Management Committee in the National Watershed for um, many years. And, and Harvard. We do a, in Harvard. And we do a lot of, and one, every year we do a muscle survey to take a look at what's going on, in part because we, we do a, a drawdown of the pond um, in the winter months under the GEIR um, to control the, the excess phosphorus that we had and the, and the invasive species. And we've had pretty good success with the phosphorus control. It's down about half, half from what it used to be. Um, but I was curious if you had any recommendations on what we should be looking for as we're doing the muscle count. We often see quite a few, you know, we look in the, we don't expect to see a lot in the zone that gets drawn down. Um, but when we get into the area that's where there's water where it isn't drawn down, 
we typically find quite a few muscles just everywhere and many juveniles. Um, so we're thinking we're doing okay, but curious if you had any thoughts. Yeah, that's great that you monitor the muscles when you do the drawdown. Um, I would also, if you happen to be around for the following talk with Jason, he did study muscles and drawdown. So I feel like he could, um, he would be a great person to contact at Mass Wildlife. Um, but yeah, he would definitely have more information for you. And that's great though, that you are monitoring those muscles when you do that. Is there anything we should be looking for um, that you can think of or? Um, do you, so do, when you do these surveys, do you, you just count them and do you also take measurements on them? We don't take measurements on them. We're not that sophisticated, but generally we look to see if the population density is changing and it doesn't seem to change. Um, yeah. And we see a lot of juveniles each year. So it's, it seems like there's, you know, there's a really healthy fish population from everything you should, you know, we're showing. So that, that explains it. We're also a habitat that has crayfish, if that makes a difference, but. Um, that, that seems, um, how big about are the juveniles that, that you find in these surveys? They're usually, you know, so, so I think we have the commoner must, the ones that are more common that you showed. Um, the juveniles are tan and the, 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 the yeah. adult muscles seem to be dark. <clears throat> and the <clears throat> juveniles can be from a half an inch when we see them to maybe an inch and a half, That's maybe right. an inch. And then, and do you, ex sorry, I have so many questions for you. Do, are you excavating the soil when you find these or are they just on the surface? They're generally sticking, you know, sticking out a little bit from the soil. It's a, it's a, it's a sediment bottom. I would, I, I mean, depends on how much time I guess you want to put into this. It seems like it'd be interesting to also um, try and measure those muscles to see how the size changes um, and, or if certain years relate to higher recruitment, something like that. Okay. You're, yeah. you're welcome to come and join us one year if you'd like. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. <laughs> oh, thank you, Bruce. Yeah, um, thank you. So there's another question. Um, won't dams have a long-term impact on muscle population because they block fish dispersal, dispersal unless they have fish ladders? Yeah, so that's um, really one of the, the benefits of dam removal to fish is stream connectivity, um, especially for muscle species that are dependent on, on migrating fish and that move long distances upstream. That can be really important for um, for recruitment and starting new muscle populations uh, because otherwise they can't access that that habitat. Okay, good. Um, so another question: Is there any historical data or information about volume of mussels present in a stream? Like anyone way back in the 1800s ever write a story about mussels? How many, if used by early settlers, etc. That's a really great question. I would love to find some kind of historical document <laughs> like that. Um, and it and it does and it goes back to you know what Kate and I mentioned in the beginning is what is a reference condition? What are we comparing right. to? Yeah. Because you put a timeline on it and it changes. Um, I mean, for for brook floater for the species that I study, we do have um, because it's also in. Um, areas of Maine that aren't impacted as as much as Massachusetts, some of the populations there can reach really high abundances compared to, to what we see in Massachusetts. And so we do have a pretty good idea that they did used to occur in high, higher abundances than what we're seeing now. Um, yeah, but you're right, it's not like that for, for all species. You know, some species are meant to, to not be in high abundance. So. <laughs> Um, if anybody does find something like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, yeah, a quick question. Have, have you tried to monitor how weather or drought impacts your, I, the, your information? 
that's the question I had about 2016, you know, what, you know, if that impacted anything. Yeah. Year yeah. After. So, so we have 2016 and then also 2020 was, was pretty right. low too. Um, and so we oh. can pair that information with um, USGS flow gauges and see how the low water levels might influence temperature or macroinvertebrates. Um, and so water temperature and th that weather pattern drought um, are really closely related. And so we often see very high temperatures when water levels are low and the ambient air temperature is high. Um, and so that affects a lot of different things. Um, as far as like fish movement, we see impacts when the, the stream dries up so much that it almost creates either a thermal barrier, so fish can't pass through really hot, hot water, or it's just too low, they can't move around as much um, if the stream is like in pools or fragment. Um, so, so it's very closely related and we're able to um, tease some of that apart comparing um, weather data to our data that we collect. Yeah. Thank you. We have um, one more question uh, from Sue Edwards related to Vin's question. I have wondered if indigenous people ate mussels and if we find evidence like mussel shells at campsites, not directly related to your research. Yeah, yeah so there is um, evidence of them being used by indigenous peoples. Um, I don't know if there's as much of that. Um, of kind of like those muscle middens. I don't know if they've if they've been excavated too much in New England or if there's too much knowledge um, around here, but I know in other areas, um, for example, out west, there's really good historical documentation of how they use muscle shells, um, especially for different types of jewelry um, and for trading. And actually that component of their research is um, a large reason why they're trying to restore uh, mussels in that area. So I can't offer as much information, I guess, uh, directly to the Nashua River watershed, but, um, but yes. But there is some. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, Thank Peter, you. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, Thank God for computers to be able to manage all the data you're collecting. <laughs> a lot of good data. There's a, a comment here from Peter Severance um, about indigenous use of mussels. There was a large shell midden of alewife floater on the Concord River at Route 2. Yeah, I don't, and it's hard to tell. So um, these shell middens are probably more from predators um, like muskrats and things like that. Oh. Um, but there are um, there are evidence of kind of um, older ones that are in kind of uh, like trash pits, like old trash pits, but you wouldn't see these just like on the riverbank, I guess, like you would see with from predators. Mm. Um, he said this is an, a known archeological site destroyed when they put in a parking lot. Ooh, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hear that. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. So, well, thank you very much, uh, Kate and Isla. That was really, really interesting. Um, appreciate it. Um, Bruce said we find many shells from mussels along the shore that form the diet of our small mammals. Yes, <laughs> we can see that a lot of those. <laughs> yeah. So, um, thank you for coming, everyone, and we hope to see you on May six when. Uh, Peter Hazelton is back and uh, speaking about the before and after Millie Turner Dam and Jason Carmignani. Not sure how you pronounce it. <laughs> um, thank you. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks, y'all.